But, and this brings me to the next threat. Precarity. If you're doing something on the internet, you don't have a right to do it. You do it on sufferance. As long as somebody's willing to cooperate and let you do it. And the, <clears throat> the internet was famously called the information superhighway. Well, imagine, of course, not all of it's a superhighway, a lot of it is streets. Imagine if you needed permission to walk out onto the street. And that permission could just be denied to you arbitrarily. That's the situation we see in the internet. If you want to write something and hand it to other people, you can do that on your own. You can even buy a printer and then print copies of things and hand them out. Or you can hand out discs, I suppose. But if you want to say something to people over the internet, you've got to get some, you've got to get the services of some company, like an ISP, and a domain registrar, and maybe a hosting company. And any of them can cut you off. And they do so whenever it's threatened with some kind of annoyance. This was brought home to us by the Dirty Tricks campaign against WikiLeaks. The Obama regime got so angry at WikiLeaks that it decided to do whatever it could to drive WikiLeaks off the net to prevent it from functioning, all without a trial. So it threatened various hosting companies, such as Amazon, and pressured them to take down WikiLeaks servers. It, atta it attacked domain companies to get WikiLeaks domains abolished. It uh, attacked payment companies. It pressured these companies, like uh, PayPal and MasterCard and Visa, to refuse to send money to WikiLeaks. And then Bank of America said it wouldn't allow the, its customers, its depositors, to send money to WikiLeaks in any fashion. This Dirty Tricks campaign shows how vulnerable <coughs> internet communication and payment is to somebody with enough power to put pressure on. We can't afford to depend on the internet if our use of it is so precarious. Those laws in France and Spain that allow administrative acts to shut down people's websites, they make the internet more precarious. And the U.S. is now considering a law allowing administrative action to confiscate a domain and uh, to block payment to activities, again, without a trial based on administrative action. The tendency to punish people without a trial has been spreading for a long time. Many countries allow organizations to be labeled as terrorists without a trial. And then people who associate with them can be punished. So, this violates freedom of association and other fundamental human rights. There are terrorists, and their acts are crimes. But punishing any kind of crime without a trial is an injustice that's more dangerous than terrorism. Terrorism is just the sort of crime that's easy to make people exaggerate the danger of. For instance, a little under 3,000 people in the U.S. were killed by an act of terrorism 
in September 2001. And around 4,000 were killed by car accidents in that same month. So which one's more dangerous? Since that time, terrorists have not been able to replicate that attack in the U.S. But cars have done it every month since then. A hundred times. Every month, 4,000 or so people killed. So, do we have a global war on car accidents? Maybe that would be more rational than the war on terrorism. But car accidents didn't play into the hands of the people who hate our freedoms. Terrorism did play into their hands. It gave them excuses to launch wars. So, which is more of a threat? The non-state-sponsored terrorists or the state? Well, even if we disregard the Iraqis who Bush killed and whose deaths Bush is responsible for because he, his crime caused them, the best estimate for that is around a million people. Let's just, let's forget about, let's put that aside and consider just the Americans that Bush killed. Well, that was 4,500 or more that Bush's invasion of Iraq killed. Well, that's more than the terrorists who attacked in September 2001. We never had a proper investigation of who was responsible for that. Bush weakened the investigation and then corrupted it, so you can't rely on its results. We, needed, we deserve a new investigation of who was responsible so that we can tell whether people in the Bush regime were partly responsible or who or what. I, I am a bit skeptical of the claim that they found the passport of, of an airplane hijacker the very next day. Maybe a passport could have survived such an airplane crash, but that they would find it so fast I want it to be proved that this really happened. In any case, we see the same thing in the UK. Terrorists killed uh, something like 60 people in London. How many people did Blyer kill by sending armies to Iraq? That was hundreds of people. And not only that, if he hadn't done that, he probably wouldn't have inspired the terrorists either. So, we mustn't be distracted from the big danger by focusing on the small danger. And that's a general tendency of people. They don't rationally evaluate dangers. I don't remember the figures for deaths from car accidents in the UK. Does anyone know? Two and a half thousand per year. Two and a half thousand per year. Well, that's, uh, that's uh, around uh, uh, 200 a month, right? So, you know, my mental arithmetic is not as good as it used to be. So, well, okay, through here too. Uh, you, why are people focusing their attention on the lesser dangers so much and paying, and not just paying money to protect themselves, but surrendering freedom as well? Car accidents don't make it easy to impose security measures that restrict people, but terrorists are a good excuse for that. So we've got to be on guard against the enemies that claim they're protecting us. <laughs>